And so, as promised, how to practice Vipassana, part three, volume one. And as I ended part two, I explained that this section was going to get to the nitty gritty and start to deal with uh, some of the main points of contemplation or main uh, anchors with which one should measure the Dhamma, measure the phenomena which one experiences when practicing the various methods in Vipassana. And all of the methods practiced re re require uh, sati sampachanya, that you have attentive focus, you maintain attentive focus. And so, before I begin with what I said I was going to talk about, which is the main part of this talk will be why we cannot see tilakana, why we cannot see the three marks of existence, or not where we cannot see them, we can see them, if we want to, if we try, but why they are difficult to see, or why they are hidden uh, behind veils, <clears throat> metaphorically speaking, of course, or not. And uh, before I begin with that, I'd like to give an introduction which is that any person who wishes to remove the kilesa, the defilement, within what is essentially pure, uh, whether you think of that as a self or a soul, or within your consciousness, within your experience. If you're a Buddhist, then you would say there is no soul or self. But that doesn't mean that something isn't there. Whatever is there is constantly changing and it's constantly in flux and constantly changing its state. But just because it's constantly changing its state doesn't mean there's nothing there. Something is there, but that something is undefinable. And so some people like to define it as a self or a paramatman, a super soul, or whatever. For me, I, I don't think it's anything to argue about. Uh, Hindus will argue that there is a paramatman, a super soul, a surviving individuality. Buddhists will argue that there is no surviving individuality, but Buddhists who have a higher understanding will not deny that something transmigrates. If not, then the Buddha wouldn't have remembered his 50,000 lives or however many, all of his lifetimes. If there's nothing transmigrates, then there's no life, previous lifetime to remember. And so, on to the preamble, which is Gan Ploi Wang, anybody who wishes to cut the Gilesas, who wishes to remove the defilement, and uh, in Thai we say Ban Luk, Ban Luk Pra Arya Pon, Ban Luk Pra Arya Bukon, to uh, enlighten to the Dharma and become a Arya Bukala, uh, a noble being, one of the four kinds of enlightened beings, a Sotapanna, Sakitakami, Anakami, or a Arahant, each of which four there are two parts. There is the path of the fruit, path of the Sotapanna, fruit of the Sotapanna, which becomes the path of the Sakitakami and then the fruit of the Sagittakami when it is attained, which is in turn the path of the Anakami, the next level of enlightened understanding and liberated uh, awareness, <coughs> liberated state. And then the uh, path of the Anakami becomes the fruit of the Anakami, which in turn becomes the path of the Arahant, which eventually, when it comes to fruition, becomes the fruit of the arahant, the path which leads to arahantship and the fruit of attainment of arahantship. So anybody who wishes to attain any of those states, which requires the cutting of the defilement, the kilesa, kiled in Thai, cannot circumvent the practice of vipassana, gammatan, because that is the method the Buddha taught to attain it. Those are the practices in which we usually academically split into 40 uh, parts, 40 sections of practice. Mm. And so, without doing vipassana, you cannot really, on this planet, 
with the teachings existing on this planet, you cannot really attain arahantship. It's perhaps arguable, but according to traditional Buddhist teaching, that is so. You can question and investigate that for yourself if it is true. And so, one of the parts, beginnings of the base, a gamatan, basic uh, foundation of the practice of vipassana, before we start to look at tilakana, the main part of this talk, and all of the rest which comes after, in the very many talks which will follow, um, one has to learn one basic technique, which is kan ploy wang, which means uh, letting go, which means uh, letting go. There are various techniques of letting go, which we can get into. Some of them are body meditations to relax every muscle and breath meditations. But one must also do abstract, uh, introspective letting go to see how the mind and the brain and the thoughts and our conditioning and our beliefs and the things we are angry about and the wrong views which lead us to be wrongly angry about things and all of these things inside which cause stress because the sound of the birds outside and the, the itchy mosquito bite that just bit you is one kind of distraction but there are many other inner distractions which are much more subtle and invisible and less noticeable unless you focus on them and get rid of them because if we are clinging we are not letting go and letting go to have a clear mind to be able to focus without distraction is very important basic for vipassana gamatan this is where the sila i would like to interject that this is also where sila comes in as important meaning the moral precepts because if we break something that we feel is immoral or we have wronged somebody with our speech our thoughts or our actions or our deeds uh, we can carry burdens of regret and those burdens of regret will interfere with our meditation and interfere with our peaceful introspection and our investigation of the Dhamma. And there will be obstacles. And so that is also where precepts come in as part of the basic practice of Vipassana Kamatan. And also Sila, those precepts are part of enlightenment as part of the three uh, major practical bodies practice bodies of practice which is seen samati banya sila samati and panya sila moral precepts samati which means uh, concentration meditative concentration focus and panya which means wisdom spiritual wisdom dharma wisdom not worldly wisdom and for samati to occur you need the sila the precepts uh, to get the concentration and for wisdom to occur panya you need samadhi which is the concentration because you need the concentration to attain jhana or dhyana or the zen which comes from the word dhyana jhana which means full absorption the four levels of absorption from the rupa jhana and arupa jhana the form form the, the absorptions which are still in the worlds of form and the absorption states which are formless and it is in those formless absorbed states of absorption where the meditator gains insight into the true nature of all things and sees the Dhamma and where his mind becomes luminous or her mind becomes luminous and illuminated even temporarily and you can get a, a preview of the enlightened state and that is where the path, if you know what the enlightened state is, even though you're not permanently, you haven't attained it, you have glimpsed it in meditation for a split second. And when you come out of it, you remember. When you come out of the jhana, you remember. And you can examine the Dhamma and remember having seen the true nature of things and see how illusory the world is in our usual state of mind. And this will show you the difference between here and there. The other shore is there, Nibbana, Arahantship, Enlightenment. And here is Samsara, Watasangsan, uh, endless rebirth in stressful existence that is um, impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not possible to maintain ownership, not self. 
And those are the three marks of existence which I'm about to talk about, titlakana, and why we can't see them so easily. And so, you have to learn to ploy wang before you can see the Dhamma. And seeing the Dhamma, part of the very important part of seeing the Dhamma outside and within, within and without, is to learn how to see titlakana, the three marks of existence. And so this is one of the important things but always remember that when you contemplate you need the first practice you need to master is ploy wang to uh, let go so that you can focus and remember the sila the sin the moral precepts which will help you to get that focus as to the panya the wisdom spiritual wisdom that comes later, and we don't need to talk about it yet, because it's not possible to understand that kind of panya, that kind of wisdom, until one is much closer to that point. And so, with letting go and sila and samati, we will learn how to attain the vipassana yan, the vipassana mind. Hmm enlightening developing mind with insight and mindfulness uh, because without this anybody who does not attain this may not be able to get rid of the defilement and to see the Dhamma and to become enlightened and so uh, part of attainment of the Vipassana Yan begins with the examination of pratrailak in Thai, pratrailak. Pra is a prefix which raises and makes more sacred or uh, reverent or high a word. So pratrailak, trai means three, both in Pali and in the Thai word trailak. Trai and lak, spelled laksanam. Trailaksana, trailak means. Uh, three characteristics or three marks mm? three marks and so it means the three marks of existence and this is extremely important to notice the presence of these three marks of existence in anything you observe and contemplate or investigate it should always be measuring with is this Dharma, be it a party, be it a good mood, be it time itself, be it the birth and death of the stars or the universe, be it the, um, the meal you just ate, be it beauty itself, be it love, be it wealth, be it happiness, be it a house, be it a fruit, be it the taste of a fruit, be it experience, memories investigate everything, the, the, feel, the painful feeling, the happy feeling, mm. are these three marks of existence present? And so what are these three marks of existence? They are anichang in Thai, anicca in Pali, tukang in Thai, tukka in Pali, anatta in both Thai and Pali, Anichang means that which is impermanent or that which is constantly changing, which is one that's the same as impermanent, always getting older, changing its position, changing its appearance, changing its state, changing its mood, changing what it's thinking, changing what it's doing, changing in time and space. All things are changing in the material universe and in the immaterial universe even our thoughts and our emotions are arising and fading giving way to the next one what I was saying a second ago has gone I'm saying something else now what I was thinking to plan what I'm going to say next is gone because I'm already saying it and I'm now thinking the next thing I'm going to say and they're like bubbles one thing going after the other Pop, 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 one after the other. 
Emotions are the same. Sensations, tastes, everything is like that. The ripples on the water, nothing ever stops moving. You watch a candle flame. If you see a candle flame and you watch it, it starts to dance. It looks pretty pretty. That's double, pretty pretty. It looks very pretty. But if you actually look at it for long enough, bore yourself with it and watch it and you will see you can look at it in different air air conditions if there's a bit of air flowing you will see it making very tiny spiky flames and it will begin to dance and dance and dance and it will start to jump around and you will think oh my god if i was this flame there is nothing that i could do to stop myself from dancing around no matter if i was tired or not because the environment forces me to do it as a candle flame and it's so tiring and it's incessant and ceaseless and you would see that actually there is dukkha there is suffering in that impermanence because what I've been explaining till now was the constant change the, the constant movement ceaseless restlessness it's restless it's completely incurable you can't stop it and it won't stop you know you go to the toilet and then you're hungry and you're and you're full and then you feel like asleep and then you wake up and you need to go to the toilet again and you wash the dishes and then you're hungry and you have to make the dishes dirty again and you're getting up and then you're sitting down then you're watching a movie then you're going to sleep there's no end to it it's incessant mm. that's impermanence anicca the first mark of existence but as we said with the candle flame, due to the incessantness of it, the incessance of it, uh, the restlessness of it, and the lack of a choice in the matter, it is also dukkha, tuk, suffering, in its most simple translation, which isn't very accurate, because dukkha means tangyu ne sapapdu may die. You cannot maintain it in the same, in its original state or in any in between state you might like it to remain in a car is going to get older it's going to get scratches it's going to wear out that's the word everything in this world is a wear em out wilf you, everything that is born wears out everything that comes into existence wears out as a thing but its essence actually just changes what is now a mountain was once under the bottom of the sea, it was a seabed, it was once a desert, it was once a lake. Yeah. And what was once leaves in the forest is now minerals inside the earth, or is perhaps vitamins inside the body of some animal. Hmm? And things change their state, but they are never destroyed. Even science agrees that you cannot destroy energy. And I don't think you can under, uh, destroy electricity or consciousness either. But things change their states. Mm. Anichang, impermanence, constant flux, ceaseless change. Tukang, dissatisfactoriness, suffering. The fact you cannot hold it as you wish and love it to stay. It's impermanent, which means it's unsatisfactory. The unsatisfactoriness is the second mark of existence. There is no permanent refuge in any of it all. And because of these two things, because you cannot make yourself stay young, you cannot keep yourself healthy, you cannot make the world do as you want it to do, none of it is yourself. If, you, if it was yourself, you could control it. You can't even control your own body. It is not self. And if you look for a self, where is it? Is it in that good mood? That good mood comes and goes, becomes a bad mood sometimes. Those are just things that come and go and disappear. But between them all, between the thoughts, the feelings, the tastes, all of the experiences, the memories, a consciousness, a knower, there's a knowing there, there is a, a witness there. But that witness cannot be found in any of those things you may find inside that which you consider to be yourself. There is no self to be found that is unchanging. Mm. If you want to say there's a self, okay, I'll let you. But the self is always changing. It never stays the same. And that's why a Buddhist argues there is no self, because there is nothing that stays permanent. 
And so a, a self in that sense would be something that has a particular character and is unchangeable and is eternal. But that cannot be found to exist. And that is the third mark of existence, anatta. And so now I think we may have understood the basics. It will actually take decades of contemplation to understand deeply what these three marks of existence are. But that's enough explanation of them for now before I begin to explain why these three things are hard to see. It was necessary to explain to you what these three things are, the three marks of existence. Tukang, sorry, anichang, tukang, anatta, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not selfness. Now you know what they are in basic. We can look at why they are so very hard to perceive. And so this is now going on to the first nitty gritty of how you should see these three things in your contemplation of the Dhamma to attain Vipassanayan. And so, to begin with, why we cannot see the three marks of existence or why they are so difficult to perceive, I will just proceed with a kata from the Kontanya Arahant, which was spoken like this. Yanginji samutayamang sapantang nirotamang Anything which arises, that thing also ceases, which is tantamount to say all things which have a beginning also have an end, which is part of the Lord Buddha's Four Noble Truths, actually. But Anyway, now as to why it is so difficult to see ti lakana, the three marks of existence. There are very scientific reasons for why you cannot see or why it's so difficult to perceive the three marks of existence. There are also superstitious or religious explanations. The first religious explanation would be that there are maras, or there is... Uh, there are gods of illusion who wish, don't wish humans to become enlightened and who therefore hide it from us. But uh, I would say that the Buddha Dhamma, I don't find that in any of the Buddha Dhamma, but I find that in Thai Buddhism. And I would say that it is more likely that the cause of not seeing Pratthrailak it's essentially that we all suffer wrong view and we do not understand the true nature of things. And ironically, seeing the three marks for existence is one of the essential elements of seeing the true nature of things and attaining wisdom of vipassana yan. So, catch 22, here is where we start. One of the scientific reasons, and we'll start with anicca, impermanence, or constant change, the ceaseless movement mm, uh, is that Kwam Bin Teng. A Teng means like an ingot or a block or a big chunk of something. And so people might say, yeah, okay, uh, a sandcastle is impermanent. You just wait a few hours and it dissolves. The scientists use that, the sandcastle, to explain the law of entropy, which is actually a law of physics now, of quant of yeah, physics, that all things fall apart. They don't build themselves together. We build things together, and things tend to uh, gather in heaps for a while, but eventually they fall apart, be they planets, meteors, or whatever, uh, stars, continents, human bodies. Mm. And some people might say, so a sandcastle, that's easy to see that that's impermanent, or the life of an insect. But uh, what about a mountain? I say, well, have you ever seen one of those movies with the clouds where they speed it up? Is it called time-lapse? Yeah, a time-lapse video. So imagine you put uh, a thousand million years, a billion years of time, and you put a time-lapse on your camera of a mountain range and you watched it. You would see that mountain range uh, doing all sorts of acrobatics. 
you'd see it arise and disappear and change shape and all sorts of stuff. It wouldn't stay still for a single moment if you speed if you could watch it in the right time frame. And the same thing happens with the constellations, which don't actually exist, apart from in our eyes, that with the stars in their movements, in their trajectories, and their orbits, in the heavens, in the firmament, as the bodies move through the firmament, they're all changing and spinning and moving and changing their state and our moods, what I'm talking about, everything's moving. But a mountain and some of these great things that change so slowly in time and take many lifetimes or generations to see a visible change, they seem permanent to us. And so that is, some things change on a very slow scale. And so it's hard to notice the impermanence in certain cases, that impermanence is present in everything. And you need to use contemplation to see that. He who sees, not just understands academically the three marks of existence, anicca, dukkha and anatta, uh, is able to let go of things. Letting go is part of vipassana, and letting go is part of enlightenment. Letting go is part of ending, cease cutting the root of the cause of suffering. Mm. And is part of attaining the enlightened mind and jhana. So letting go, uh, when you start to see impermanence, you stop clinging to those impermanent things because you see just this favorite glass of yours, this favorite teacup, it's already broken. You know it's going to be broken at some point. And the day it breaks, you're already prepared for it. And so even if it does uh, hurt a bit, it will be softer than a person who has not practiced. And if you can attain vipassana, yan, Nothing will happen when it breaks to you. You won't, will not break. When the cup breaks, you will not break. But if you have not, then it might break you a little bit. But if you've practiced a bit, however much you've practiced, that's how much it will help you. Hmm? And so Kwampinteng uh, blocks you hard to see impermanence in things. And because we cling to these impermanent things, that is also and the state of their constant change, the restlessness of it, and the fact that we cannot hold on to them forever. There is dukkha, the second mark, unsatisfactoriness. And this is hard to see too. I'll give you one reason to see why it's hard to see. Firstly, we have moments where the enjoyment in our consciousness overtakes the suffering. But suffering is always present. It is never not present. There's never a single second when it's not present to a certain degree. And we can prove this. You find a hammock or your favorite bean bag or cushion or sofa and you go and lie down. You can even take a massage if you want. I say you just lie down and you find the most comfortable position you want. You just stay in that position where it's perfect, totally comfortable. And you wait for a minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, thirty minutes, forty-five minutes, fifty-seven minutes, one hour, twenty-three minutes, seven hours, forty-eight minutes, fifteen hours, seventy-two minutes, which doesn't even exist. They're not here anyway. And so on. And at some point, what's going to happen? Hmm? What's going to happen? You're going to start aching, you're going to feel uncomfortable, or you're going to want to change your position. And it's going to, what was once the most comfortable position of pleasure, is going to start become uncomfortable and painful. And so, actually, the reason we don't notice the presence of this constant pain is because we keep changing position. So if you look, you find a comfy position, the next time you change position, Look at yourself as you're changing it. Remind yourself, hey, look, I'm changing position. Why am I changing? And you'll notice it's because it became uncomfortable. And the f because dukkha became noticeable. Our dukkha is not noticeable because we keep changing position. In Pali or in Thai Pali, we call this iriyabot, one of the meanings of the word iriyabot. Iriyabot can also mean walking meditation. 
by, for example. But area bot in this case means changing position. And so because we keep changing, we distract ourselves from the fact that there is actually in the background a little hum, a little background noise, which is dukkha, it's constantly present. It's an ache, it's a pain, it's a throb, it's an itch. Hmm? It's an insect biting, and if it isn't, even in your favorite hammock, it slowly becomes an ache. You stay in bed all day, you'll become bedridden, your legs will become like matchsticks, you won't be able to walk. So there you go. Dukkha is difficult to see, the second mark of existence is very difficult to see for many reasons, but one example is Iriabod, that you change position before it becomes consciously, overbearingly noticeable that actually your bum's aching, which mine is right now as I'm talking because I'm sitting in the same position since about uh, 15 minutes now. So I'm going to change position now because I've slowly become aware of the presence of an ache in my lower back. Uh, so there you go, dukkha is present. It's just not always noticeable. And because of the mixture of pleasure and pain, you can, you can, pleasure, I call it excitement or stress, because actually, if you look, film people on a roller coaster and watch their faces, actually they're experiencing stress. But that's a bit subtle. Most, most people in daily life, they like to get excited and they call it fun. But actually for a, a if you attain higher practice, you will begin to see that as stress and suffering. But anyway, so now we would have to move on to the last of the three marks of existence and anatta, not self, and why this is hard to see, which I'm sure most people will agree it's very hard, difficult to understand, never mind see. So I'll use an example, sorry, use an example of I would have to speak slowly of, uh, a little bit about the kandas. The kandas are five ways of categorizing the, ex the way we experience our inner life and the outer world through our senses. Uh, basically your form, your physical body, <coughs> and the forms you see through your eyes, and the ones you imagine in your mind. It's form. Uh, Vitana, your feelings, your emotions, your reactions. Uh, sanya, your memory or your perception. Sankhan, which means, uh, can mean your body, but it means all conditioned things, and it means your conditioned thoughts, or the table, the party, all of these abstract concepts we have. And last, Vinyan, which means uh, your consciousness, or awareness of, becoming aware of, the part which, the, the, the witness who is aware, the awareness part. And so these five things are within us, and we experience the world through them, and our six inner senses, hearing, taste, touch, smell, sight, and so on. And uh, our outer senses, so the things we see, the things we hear, the objects we hear, the sound of the bird, the bird we see, the taste of the meat of the bird, and so on. Um, and uh, so there are things like the bird. Is that not self? We have that's not self, it's not me. It's the bird, it's outside of me. And the sound of the bird, is that not self? Is that the third mark of existence? Is that present in the sound of the bird? No, that's the sound of the bird, that's not me. And so, uh, the taste of the orange, is that me? Is that the orange is me? No, mm, the taste of the orange, that's not me. Okay. You can always say these are not me. Well, how about the joy that arises from the taste, from the... Oh, consciousness, the awareness, which happens when the taste, when the awareness of the taste of the orange or the fruit enters the consciousness because the fruit gave a taste to the tongue and the senses passed it through perception into the consciousness and the conscious became aware. Once it became aware, it remembered becoming aware and then the brain started to think. Hmm. And this all happened when the hand took the orange and put the fruit into the mouth and the mouth masticated it and certain juices came out and chemical reactions happened, hit the tongue 
and the tongue sent a message to the brain and the brain woke up the consciousness and the conscious, consciousness remembered the event that had happened a split second before it was awoken and told about it. And then memories of having previously eaten those things and no, you like that or you like a taste, you remember a taste, something like it and you decide that's nice, not that's disgusting and then an emotion happens and says, I like, yeah, that's joy because that tastes like something I remember that once made me feel good and that's a series of events goes on like a chain of events, boom, 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 boom one thing like a, a baton like in those um, what do you call it? relay races where one runner passes the baton to the next relay runner and he passes it on to the next one. But there is no person on the back of each runner who jumps onto the back of the next runner. There is no individual traveling on the back of each of those events. There's just a series of events which ends up with the consciousness becoming a, a witness of, of it all. There's a witness of the events, as in a witness of the taste of the fruit, there's a witness of the emotion of joy, there's a witness of the thoughts which arose. But those thoughts and those emotions, the taste itself and the transmission to the brain, they all came and went. The person is not in those. If the person was in those things, the self was in those things, then the self would be dead because those things have disappeared already. It's not self. Hmm? But why can't we see it so easily? Well, the sound of the bird is not the self. The bird in the tree is not the self. The wind in your hair is not the self. It's outside. And so we have a hot wind and a cool wind. Hmm? We have a gusty wind and a light wind. Let's compare those with emotions. We have a light-hearted, relaxed emotion. We have a cheeky, want-to-play emotion. We have a sad emotion. We have a completely angry emotion. Are they not like a hot wind or a calm wind or a gusty wind or a cool wind? Hmm? Or like cool water and hot water. But cool water and hot water is not self. And the cool wind that blows up and blows away and disappears and gives rise to a hot wind and blows away and then becomes a gusty wind and then becomes a cool wind and then becomes a calm wind mm. and keeps changing all of the emotions within just like the thoughts which pass up and down arise and fall mm. they're inside our candors, our five aggregates they're inside our senses, they're inside our consciousness and we experience them as coming from within and so we identify with them as the self that's my mood, that's my day off that's my uh, thoughts, that's my opinion that's my reaction, that's my belief that's my feeling about this that's how it makes me feel, that's my feeling that's me mm. But the sound of the bird, that's not me, that does what it wants. Well, doesn't your emotion and your brain think what it wants? Are you not just a witness? And they come and go. Are they not self? But we can see not self in things outside of those kandas, the five aggregates. Rup, vetana, sanya, sankhan, vinyan, form, feelings, perception and memory, um, conditioned thoughts and consciousness and all of the events which we experience as our life and the world around us how we perceive everything and experience the world and interact with it happens through those five candors and we identify falsely with the things the events which arise in our consciousness through perception which transmits everything that happens through those five candors as an event to us as a play and our minds make a shadow play a puppet theater on the on the screen of our minds of our imagination and our conditioned minds our thoughts create opinions and reactions and our emotions interact with our thoughts and they reflect each other a thought creates a reaction an emotion and an emotion conditions the thought to think further and make further one-sided opinions siding with itself usually 
And so that's why anatta, not self, is very hard to see. One of the many reasons. And so I'll raise as they occur to me and I will interject them throughout in all of the following podcasts whenever the whenever it is fitting and relevant but you must try to contemplate these points and try to penetrate an understanding and then convert that understanding as you contemplate the events as they happen within your consciousness whether you're meditating or whether you're just doing vipassana trying to remain mindful and and, and see the dhamma in your daily life as it happens in daily doings and start to practice and I'm going to have to get into anabhanasati breath focus as an anchor so that you can keep your mind focused in the distractions of daily life because this vipassana as I'm going to point it out doesn't happen for an hour a day in the in the meditation room or when you go to the temple once a month this happens when you wake up and it happens when you go to sleep and it doesn't stop because you're supposed to practice it till it becomes second nature and it becomes constantly present in your consciousness throughout the day. And so, this was the end of How to Practice Vipassana Part 3 of Volume 1 of I don't know how many talks this is going to be. And uh, I'll leave it out this time what I'm going to talk about the next time because... Uh, I'd like to think more about it and might take us to the next step of how we're going to practice vipassana properly according to the way it is supposed to be practiced as taught by the great masters the Sajan Spencer once more hoping this helps for the Buddha Magic Project signing off